Hello, everyone, and welcome to Applying Behavior-Based Solutions to Sewage Pollution, our seventh webinar in a series of online activities about ocean sewage pollution. This series is presented by the Nature Conservancy with support from the Reef Resilience Network and NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. My name is Kristen Mays. I'm the Reef Resilience Network Manager and your host for today's webinar. We're really excited to be joined by Katie Velasco, Director of Operations and Engagement for RARE's Center for Behavior in the Environment. Katie works to build demand for applying behavioral science to, to sustainability challenges worldwide, including leading the Solutions Search Program, which we'll learn about today, and managing external engagements and partnerships for RARE. During the webinar, Katie will explain how to use behavior-centered design to develop feasible strategies for addressing the problem of ocean sewage pollution. She will explain how to get people to change or engage in a specific behavior, and will share examples related to ocean sewage mitigation. As a reminder, the Reef Resilience Network is developing a body of resources for managers to address the threat of sewage. In addition to this webinar series, resources include an online toolkit and course to help managers build understanding on this topic and the ways they can act. The toolkit, which features web pages, case studies, and journal article summaries, is going to be launched next month, so stay tuned for an announcement on that. Also relevant to this webinar are Reef Resilience Network communication resources. On reefresilience.org, under Science and Strategies in the menu, you'll find a communication toolkit. This toolkit provides guidance on visual design, social marketing, and communication planning for managers to help them protect reefs. There's more, so take a look. Uh, our social marketing section was developed in collaboration with RARE and links to many of RARE's resources. Our communication planning process is presented as web pages and also as a planning guide, which is shown on the slide. It follows, the guide follows a similar process that Katie is going to share about shortly and like the rare process, it also emphasizes the goal of getting a specific audience to take a specific action, which we'll hear a lot about shortly. Before we begin, I'd like to just go over a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar will be one hour. It is being recorded. The recording will be sent out to our mailing list after the webinar. We'll also be sharing a PDF of Katie's slides. Thank you, Katie. Following the presentation, we'll have a discussion session. Remember, there are two ways you can ask questions. You can type your question into the question box at any time during the webinar, or you can raise your hand during the discussion session and we'll unmute your microphone so you can ask your question yourself. If you're having any technical difficulties, such as trouble hearing or seeing the slides, please type a message into the question box and we will help resolve your issue. Before we hear from Katie, we just wanna take a minute to hear from you through a really short poll. So our first question is, what is the focus region of your work? So we'd love to get a sense of, of where folks participating in the webinar are joining us from or where you work. Give a minute to let those come in. Okay, looks like we're split evenly between Caribbean, Atlantic, and Pacific, which isn't surprising given the time of the webinar. Um, they know it's not great for Western Indian Ocean folks. Um, thank you for sharing. Our next question is, do you have experience trying to influence people's behavior to benefit the environment? Wow. Okay, looks like many of you on the, or most of you on the call do. That's wonderful. Um, good to know for the discussion. And it looks like a few of you are maybe new to this, but would like to. Thank you for sharing. Um, I now, Katie, will pass it over to you um, and we can get going with the presentation. Give you a Great. few minutes. Welcome. Thanks for joining Hi. us. 
Thank you for having me. All right. Let's see, can you see my screen? Yes. Great. I'll get started. So, hi everyone. I'm Katie Velasco. I am coming to you um, right now from my virtual Center for Behavior in the Environment, which um, is also my basement. Um, for the time being, and I'm excited to talk a little bit about the role that behavioral insights can play in addressing ocean sewage pollution. So just off the bat, getting it out there, I am not an ocean sewage pollution expert. Um, I spend more of my time thinking about behavioral insights and design thinking, and I've had the opportunity over the last year to be learning about this um, pollution problem and the, the crisis facing our oceans, and while learning and listening and talking, hearing to other experts speak, I realized there is a significant role that behavioral and social sciences can play in tackling this issue. And so that's part of what I'm excited to talk about today. In particular, um, one of the things that we do at our Center for Behavior in the Environment is we help translate um, some of the research that exists in other fields, um, whether they be environmental or not, and help bring that to different kinds of conservation and sustainability challenges. Um, I say that just because you're gonna hear some examples from me that will come from different fields and different places, and that's um, part of what I'm really excited to talk about is then exploring how that can translate to the ocean sewage pollution problem. So just to start off, so everyone, in case everyone's familiar, um, there. Uh, just a little bit about RARE. RARE's been around for about um, 40 years, and over that time we've run um, about 450 different kinds of community uh, behavior change campaigns with different 100 different partners um, in 60 countries around the world. We have offices in different countries around the world, and um, back in 2017 launched our Center for Behavior in the Environment to help um, bridge the gap that exists and between the work that we are doing on the ground and the learning and experience that we had uh, with the latest in emerging science and research in behavioral and social sciences. So we spend a lot of time at our center thinking about how can we make um, and translate some of this, this um, research into practical information to make best-in-class programs happen on the ground. So as we look at these environmental programs and um, our projects and challenges that we face, one of the things that we have found at the center is that virtually every environmental challenge has one thing in common. It's that someone somewhere needs to be doing something differently, whether that is a farmer or a fisher or a business leader or a government official, there's someone that we need to do something different. Um, and so with the sewage problem, that's really no different. We, um, we have technologies in many places of the world. The challenge is really in adoption and implementation. And so when we hear that, part of what really sparks and triggers in my mind is this idea that um, we're, address we're facing some behavioral challenges that need to be addressed. So if we dig into the behavioral side of the equation, one of the things um, on the, off off on the um, offset of starting a behavioral problem or tackling a behavior a problem is understanding decision making and what motivates people to um, take some sort of behavior in um, and go forth. And so when we look at um, decision making, we have a spectrum of decision making that often happens. Um, we, in the one hand, we have this very rational side of thinking. We are very um, thoughtful. We look at a return on investment. We weigh the costs and the benefits and we are very intentional about maximizing for time or money or something, but we have this time um, and we spend a lot of time thinking through um, how we kind of make the best decision possible and behave accordingly. On the other side, we have this very instinctive, reactive, emotional, automatic, quick way of making a decision. It happens rapidly and um, over the course of our day, we're making thousands and thousands of decisions and they all fall along the spectrum where some are calculated, some are not, some are rational, some are emotional. Um, and so when we start thinking about addressing and tackling problems, we need to be thinking about the spectrum of decision making. Now, the challenge is that when we look at traditional conservation approaches and environmental approaches, we often are designing for the more rational side of people's brains and they're more calculated approaches. So we're thinking if we just told them information, if they just knew how big the problem was, we just gave them the data, then they would make the best decision for, us, um, for the environment. 
Or maybe if we gave them something, if we gave them money, if we gave them a reusable bag, if we gave them a toilet, then they'll suddenly use it and our problems will be solved. Or if we just pass a law or we make um, policy to support the work that we want to do, that will change behavior. And all of this is to say those are very critical um, levers for change. You, they are on one side of our decision-making spectrum. The challenge is, is that they are often limited. When you look at that spectrum of decision-making, they're not playing to the whole host of different ways that people make decisions. So the problem too is that when we look at the challenges associated with ocean sewage pollution, they're often, in the behavioral side of things, they're often not made with a rational mind. There's other parts of this spectrum that are coming into play. On the one hand, you have this, you've got to go, you've got to go, you have this urgency, maybe panic, um, you're rushing to make a quick decision, you don't have time necessarily to sit there and weigh all the costs and benefits and, and sleep on it and that kind of thing. You're also socially taught not to talk about this issue. It's gross, there's a stigma, you might be embarrassed. And so we're not feeding into this whole decision-making body, um, or there's lots at play here beyond just this rational school of thought. And then finally, um, this is a photo from um, Alexandria, Virginia, which is near where I live in the United States, of sewer systems and talking about if you live in those homes or apartment buildings, and whether it's rainy or not, your experience is still the same. So regardless of if there's a wastewater overflow into the river, it's a flush it and forget it. It's an invisible problem. We are really bad at solving problems that we can't see, um, that aren't tangible to us. And so these problems that we're facing with ocean sewage pollution don't often align fully with this rational way and rational school of thought. So at our Center for Behavior and the Environment, one of the things that we promote is that there is a more comprehensive set of tools that we can use when addressing uh, behavioral challenges. We can not only work on the levers to the rational side, but also pull in some of this more emotional or rapid or instinctive decision making that comes into play. So what that looks like is one, the idea of an emotional appeal, that our emotions are often more powerful than reason. Our hearts, despite what we want to believe, our hearts can overtake our mind um, in what we, what we are about to, to embark on or take on. Um, two, our social influences. So we're inherently a social species. We care what our peers think. We care whatever our social group is, whether that's religious, uh, school, family, friends. Um, we care what our group thinks about us. We want to be approved of. We want to be part of the group. So that's another influence that comes into play. And finally, this idea of choice architecture, this idea that um, the context, the structure of our decision-making environment matters, whether that's the timing, um, the different kind of choices that are provided to us, that all matters when we're making decisions. And so as we think about these levers, um, there are different kinds of strategies you can use within each one of those um, to make and to encourage people to take on the kind of behavior that you would like. So this is just a checklist and we have it available on our website on behavior.rare.org and it's very small font, but the purpose of why I'm showing you this is that there's all sorts of different kinds of strategies. This isn't even fully comprehensive, um, but all sorts of different strategies we can use um, to make behaviorally informed interventions that play not only to the more emotional side of things, but also to the rational side of things. There are ways to be, create behaviorally informed material incentives that can be very effective in driving change. And so what you see here um, and what we promote at the center and looking through is like, how do we take these levers and then put them into sort of behavioral strategies and design principles that we can apply um, to different challenges? So, Looking at these three new levers, one of the things that I thought might be useful is actually to talk through some design principles and what they look like and at the center, how we think about translating them from entirely different fields, um, translating them and how they could be relevant for this ocean sewage world. Um, so getting started with the first one is this emotional appeal. So if you give people something to feel good about, they'll actually listen. So that's the principle um, that I'm talking about here. This example is chocolate cake, which is one of my favorites. Um, so this is an example of some researchers. They um, put people into three treatment groups. In the first group, they put a chocolate cake in the table on, of the room where these people were sitting, and they said, imagine how guilty you will feel if you eat this cake. 
the shame of all these calories, you all ruined your diet. This just would be awful if you ate this cake. Um, and they left the room. The next group, they said, imagine how proud of yourself you would be if you avoid, if you don't eat this cake. You know, your willpower, you will have um, sustained whatever sort of health goals you'll have. Just imagine how proud you are. And then the third group, um, they didn't say anything. They just put, left the cake on the table, didn't reference it, and went out. Now, the reason I'm telling you this, and you can probably guess the punchline, is that when they looked, went back and looked at the percentage that completely resisted eating the cake, the messaging about pride did, pride did substantially better than the other sorts of messaging around the, either the control group or the shame group. And so that becomes important when we think about our environmental messaging. Here, um, shame, where we often have these doom and gloom messages about guilt, um, did worse than saying nothing at all. Um, and also, this concept of pride or, pride or being um, proud of your natural resources or the environment also really resonates with people. Those dots that you saw of RARE's programs at the beginning, many of those are actually what we call, or most of those, are all what we call pride campaigns, where we actually um, empower communities to um, take control of their natural resources and their um, local environments and feel proud of what they can do to be stewards. Um, and so flipping the script just a little bit has substantial impacts in terms of how people think about their relationship and behavior um, to whatever kind of targeted action or outcome we have um, upcoming. So that's one design principle in the emotional appeal space. The second that we have is around um, social influences. So if you show people where the herd is going, they're going to want to go there too. So this is a study out of Stanford University in California in the United States. And basically, they went to a cafe at lunchtime and they talked to people in line waiting to order. And in one scenario, they said people limit how much meat they eat. In the other scenario, they said people have started to limit how much meat they eat. So they said these things and then they sent people off um, to order their food and um, they measured exactly how many people ordered vegetarian meals or not. And what they found is the slight change in the text also has a very big impact because it is signaling something to people. In the first group with people limit how much meat they eat, you're either part of that group, you're either somebody who limits the amount of meat you eat or you're not. You're in group or you're out group and you are identifying, self-identifying what your peers do. In the second group, where you're saying people have started to limit how much meat you eat, you're starting to signal to people that the norm is shifting, it's dynamic, it's moving, and that they can be part of the herd that goes on. It's probably triggering something in our brains related to on the savanna not wanting to be left behind or survival. I'm not totally sure, but the idea here is that we can, in our messaging, um, use this idea about social norms and influences and how people are shifting and adopting in our design principles and thinking about how do we get peer groups um, to start sh signaling to others the shift that they are taking on. So that's something around a social influence that can be incredibly powerful and relevant to folks. Now, the third principle here is around choice architecture. So when it comes to choice, less can be more. In the environmental sector, we love these things that say 50 simple ways to make your life greener. We love to give people a whole host of options of things that they could do and say, okay, um, you pick the top three or four or give people the option to do that. In reality, that can almost lead to some sort of decision paralysis. And so what we have here, um, you will notice that in the center, we love food. And so here's another example um, related to food. So this one is related to um, jam or jelly. Um, it's just a fruit spread that you can put on crackers or toast if it's not um, familiar to folks. But in one scenario, these um, researchers, they set up a table in a grocery store and they set up these um, sta the station where they offered people samples to taste the jam or jelly. And then if they wanted to, they got a coupon that they could go purchase some. In the first scenario, they put out six different types of jam or jelly to taste. 40% of people stopped for a taste and then 30% went on um, to purchase that. In the next scenario, they gave people 24 different types of jam or jelly, which I don't even know 24 different types of flavor combinations, but they had them. And what's interesting here is 60% of people stopped for a taste. So a lot more stopped to taste the jam. The problem is 
only 3% purchased. And the, the problem here is that people were almost overwhelmed. And so oftentimes when we feel overwhelmed by the number of choices, we don't make any choice. We don't take any action. And so when we think about um, behavioral interventions, our end behavior here, the targeted behavior, purchasing jam, not tasting the jam, but purchasing is decreased by the number of choices that are available to us. And so that's really important as we start thinking about designing interventions and helping people prioritize what is the most impactful thing that we can be asking them to do because we can't ask them to do too much. So those are three kinds of principles um, that you can apply in some of the science that underpins them. And we talk about at the center and exploring how that can then translate um, to the environmental sector. And, and, and part of what we talk about is in design, how do we then apply those um, to the work we do? So we give people something to feel good about and they'll actually listen, this concept of pride. Um, we show people where the curd is going and they'll wanna go to this dynamic or shifting norm. And when it comes to choice, less can be more. So not putting people into some sort of decision paralysis, but really helping them understand where we want them to go in, in, in the most impactful way possible. So the question then becomes, how do you know, you, you saw this giant PDF with all these different kinds of principles, we've talked about all these levers, how do you know which one to apply and where and what that looks like? Um, so at the center, we talk about this concept of behavior-centered design. And what that means is it takes the latest thinking in um, human-centered design and brings also in um, this concept of behavioral insights and behavioral science and merges the two into a stepped process that helps us strategically apply these behavioral insights in a way that can really um, create an impactful behavioral intervention. So um, this is where we start to think about how we translate this jam and cake and vegetarian meals into a sewage pollution type of situation. And so each of these steps um, are here, just kind of digging into them. Um, as Kristen referenced, um, these steps to you um, may seem very similar to some of the strategic communications um, work and other lessons you've had with Reef Resilience Network, and that's because they are. Um, they may have different names, but the methods that you see here are tried and true. They are steps strategically proven to have an impact if you follow them and um, design accordingly. So the first step of this, pro of, um, this design challenge is actually framing out the problem, framing out the situation, and then identifying who is your target audience and what you want them to do. And this is very specific because it's not um, what you want them to do, I want to reduce food waste, or I wanna reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It's, I want them to compost. It's very specific a behavior um, that you can ask people to do and they will know exactly what to do as a result of that ask. The next step is around empathizing and understanding what is their experience. And this is very important because it is not what your experience it is, and it's not what you think their experience is. It is actually asking your target audience what their experience is. And then from that, you can start drawing some of these behavioral insights and mapping on um, the levers to understand which strategies might resonate for them based on what you are learning and hearing from them. Um, from there, you can start identifying and ideating solutions, prototyping some of the best ones, filtering them down, testing them, and then figuring out what might apply at scale. And what's really important here also that I wanna highlight is that in pretty much any conservation space, but also in our just daily lives, once we identify in the frame step the problem, what do we want our audience to do? We have a tendency or a need to almost jump into the ideation of solutions. So we have a problem here, what do we want them to do? Okay, let's figure out what we want them to do. And what we advocate for and what is necessary is actually taking the time to map out how the behavioral insights can be designed in a way that can um, really create an intervention that will be most impactful for the kinds of work um, that we're and kinds of outcomes that we're looking to achieve. So I just wanna talk through an example of what this could look like on the ground. Um, so many folks here are probably familiar with Haiti, um, soil in Haiti. Um, it's an organization um, we have, um, is one of our finalists in this solution search contest, which I'm happy um, to talk a little bit more about. Um, but what I wanna talk about with Haiti is how um, they have gotten their technology, which is this composted toilet, 
how they have actually effectively um, got it adopted in many communities and households across um, the country. So as we talked through and we looked through the levers, they started and they have some of the, the more traditional rational levers. So they have regulatory frameworks that support, they work with government officials to support the regulations that um, engage, um, the, that support their toilets and the usage of their toilets. They communicate out with the community the health risks associated with um, the pollutants and the um, organic compounds in the water systems. They also gave out hygiene kits and offered pay scales or different payment levels um, for different households. So they offered um, an understanding there were financial um, costs associated, but they kind of um, alleviated that depending on what was available for the household. So they thought about all the uh, traditional levers. What they then also layered on is and balanced out are some of these um, newer behavioral insights. So they, with emotional appeals, they communicated out security, dignity, comfort. These are all positive feelings. Um, they didn't communicate pride or shame from any sort of open defecation or poor sanitation issues, but they really resonated with people, the positive associations with um, using their composting toilet. They also employed social influences. They put out a peer referral network and campaign. They also did some local marketing. They kind of created a social buzz around using these toilets. They made it something that people were interacting and learning about. It wasn't this taboo that no one was discussing. And so it became um, more socially acceptable to engage on. And then finally, with the choice architecture and the context, they were thinking about like, what is the convenience factor? The toilets are in homes, but also um, they have regularly scheduled pickups. People know and can expect when to have their their compost or their um, waste collected to be turned into compost. And so all of these levers come into play um, in helping cr them create an effective solution that has been adopted. Um, the really key thing that I want to highlight here is this idea of this empathize piece. So all of these interventions came because they actually talked to their audience. They heard um, what people wanted, what messages resonated with them, and then went ahead and started applying them. So it's critically important to understand your audience um, from their perspective. And that's what um, Soil did in designing this sort of intervention. So you might also be sitting here and thinking like, all this behavioral stuff is related to end consumers and our target audiences are probably kind of the public audience and that kind of thing. And it's not related to business or governments or that kind of thing. But the reality is, is that um, businesses are made up of people too. They are, they might have some um, structures in place that require them to be a little bit more rational to make their decisions um, based on some more return on investment um, type uh, vehicles, but in reality too, they are also people, and we know that these business um, and personal relationships matter, and that people, businesses are influenced. Um, there's one study that actually looked at wastewater dischargers, so these municipal facilities that process um, waste. This is in Kansas, which is in the United States, a state in the United States, and it looked at these um, utilities. And um, in this study, they sent utilities um, statements. And in the and letters, and in those letters was a statement that said X percent of Kansas municipal facilities, so a peer group for this audience, um, X percent of Kansas municipal facilities comply with the discharge limits to a greater extent than your facility complies with limits. So suddenly you're hearing, I am not doing as well as my peers in this way. And as a result, they found an 8% reduction in the ratio of reported discharges. Um, so just this messaging, it works um, in a little bit different of a way, but it works in a way that can create change even in a corporate setting. It's just a different way of thinking about the design um, and a different target audience, but you can use these same things in designing for business leaders or government leaders. Um, so I am probably, I'm trying to leave a lot of time for discussion and exploring. So the last two things that I want to highlight, um, if you're interested in learning more and kind of exploring the role that behavioral insights can play in the sewage pollution challenge, we have, um, our team has a virtual training. These are all virtual options. Um, one is a virtual training coming up at the beginning of next month, um, which we'd love for anyone who's interested to attend. 
we are joining with um, in World Water Week, and this is open to people who are not even registered for World Water Week, but anyone can join World Water Week, um, Nature Conservancy, our Center for Behavior and the Environment, Imagine H2O and Gates Foundation. We're hosting a presentation and a workshop the 24th and 25th of August. And then um, we're going to have a virtual conference September 21st through 23rd um, featuring the role that behavioral insights can play in water pollution. Um, so uh, registration for that should hopefully open in the next week and um, would love anybody who's interested um, to join us and to learn more. And the final thing that I just want to promote is if you can't join any of that, please sign up for behavior.rare.org. Um, this is a portal we have that really features and highlights all of our um, tools and resources. They're free. You just have to put in your email address um, and you'll be able to access a lot of our um, worksheets, toolkits, um, the PDF, all sorts of different things are available um, for folks. And that's where we often post some of the latest research and how um, it can be put into action. So with that, I think um, I will pause and kind of open up for discussion. Yay, thanks, Katie. That was, yeah. that was awesome. Really appreciate that uh, great overview. We'd now like to open up the webinar for discussion, as Katie mentioned. Joining Katie is her rare colleague and behavioral scientist, Philippe Bujo, and TNC's senior scientist and in-house sewage expert, Stephanie Ware. Uh, let's see. Oh, great. You're all there. Hi. Welcome, everybody. Um, so yeah, webinar participants, please um, send in your questions. I see some of you have already started to do so through the question box. So feel free to send them through the question box. I can read them aloud or feel free to hit that little hand icon next to your name and you can ask your question yourself. Okay, so this one came in during the presentation and I feel like you kind of uh, addressed this towards the end, Katie, but um, we will ask this again. How should a reef manager get started in applying behavioral interventions? Does RARE offer support? So yes, there's lots of different ways that we offer support. One is like, if you just wanna start poking around, it's through our behavior.rare.org portal. We have that, we have trainings available. We're gonna have some um, self-driven trainings too coming up soon um, on our new platform. We also offer um, some very customized both trainings and learning and advisory and design services where our actually team can partner with you on digging in further. So my recommendation would be to start poking around a little bit just to like start feeling comfortable, but we have a whole suite of low to high touch ways that we can kind of support the work that you have going. Awesome. And we will, our last slide has some links um, just as a reminder of, of where to go to get started. So um, stay tuned for that. Okay, this is a bigger question, but how, why do you think behavioral insights are an emerging field in the conservation sector? Yeah, um, so I, we've been doing a little bit of reflection and I'm sure we don't have the best, most comprehensive answer out there. Um, but one of the things that we've read a lot about and heard from um, many folks as we've been um, research and talking to them is that most environmental, most people in the conservation sector have biological and natural science backgrounds. So there was a study of um, the Future of Conservation Survey went out and surveyed 10,000 conservationists worldwide. Less than 10% of them identified as having a social science background, which um, when it comes to actually starting to address a problem, when we're faced with a problem, we often pull tools from our toolkit and if we don't have those tools in our toolkit, we're not going to pull them out. Um, and so part of what we try to do at the center is get these tools into practitioners hands so that we are as well versed at applying these behavioral natural sciences, which are critically important to addressing the problem if we do it properly, but also in understanding the, the role that people play and studying how people can be part of our solution. I just wanted to make a comment on that, Kristen. Um, it was interesting for me to see the poll re response and that 95% of the participants um, have described themselves as being involved in some kind of behavior change in this space. And I think that it's, a, it's a, just a really good reminder that our work is often really about people. So it's what, what you've just said, Katie, um, 
about so many of the practitioners having a natural science background. It's interesting to put a bunch of natural scientists out in the world to deal with people when they may not have been really trained to do that. And so what, what I imagine in some cases are people that are like, I had this experience. I was trained as a natural scientist and all of a sudden I was dealing with community issues and trying to figure it out. And um, we all need a little bit of that kind of training just to start but we also probably aren't interacting with people in the most effective and efficient ways. Even though we are trying to change their behavior when we're working at the community level, we may not be doing it in such a methodical way that you've laid out. And so that's, this is a great opportunity for people to go, yeah, I've been doing this, but here are all these different ways I might be able to refine and, and step back a minute and look at how I'm doing it. I might jump in just very quickly to, yeah. to take some of the blame off of us conservationists also. I think one big thing that's happened also in the last 10 years, so behavioral insights, behavioral sciences are becoming very, very popular and they started becoming super popular around 10 years ago in different fields. So mostly the finance sector, the healthcare center. Um, and that's mainly because they were targeting the, what we call low hanging fruits. Um, so behaviors that were easy to change with just like sending a different letter or changing messaging. So a few cents here and there to get a few percent change somewhere. Um, obviously in conservation, these low hanging fruits aren't necessarily as present and everything is gonna cost a bit more than in these other fields, right? So as much as yes, we're all natural scientists and we're kind of getting to, to grips with these things, there's also been this other aspect where a lot of behavioral scientists haven't really engaged with this aspect of the field with yeah the, the problem that is climate change with that is reef management all these things um so so in one sense it's also because our problems are more complex but thankfully as we're digging into this we're also realizing that people are changing their views and people are finding new strategies to tackle these more complex problems um so that's something we do at rare and it's something that's really starting to pick up speed in the last just three years i would say there's a lot more strategies that are proven um, so we can start being a bit more evidence-based and rely less on yeah, that implicit intuition that we're all relying on for behavior change. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, and, and just to circle back to the poll, um, that it was quite surprising to me and I think really speaks to kind of the evolution of this field or, you know, being um, such a, a tool to tackle conservation issues because I feel like that whole even a year ago we it would have been totally flip. Um, so thanks for highlighting that stuff. Okay. And um, so this message, hi Katie, this was so informative and resonated really well with me. As a fundraiser, how can we use behavioral change methods to also make this important work more palatable to donors and funding orgs? Yeah. Um, so that's something that we actually think a lot about within the center and part of actually what I spend a lot of thinking about, time thinking about too, part of my job generally is in building demand for applying behavioral insights. And so one of the ways that we think about um, apply, building demand and increasing the role and kind of spotlight of behavioral insights is obviously that like funders are a big influencer in this field and they have a big kind of role in directing um, how our conservation and environmental programs go. And so one of the things um, that we've been thinking about is really trying to demonstrate, you know, funders, they want their investments to be positive. They want to see results. They want to um, feel good about the work that they're doing um, and that their money is actually going towards change. And so one of the things that we have been working on is trying to provide some of that evidence um, that there is a solid, um, peer-reviewed, science-backed reason um, for applying behavioral insights, that they can feel good that their investments are doing things um, there's a, that are, are meaningful. I think a lot of um, finance or investors, um, there's a certain subset that like, like to be cutting edge and like do the cool new stuff. And then there's a lot of funders who like want to feel safe in where their money is going. And so I think making sure that there's evidence that exists. I know, um, Philippe can talk a little bit about um, some work we just did to help um, G, uh, the global environment um, facility understand the role that um, behavioral insights can play in a um, scientific way so that um, people, funders feel good. Yeah, so as you're saying, it, it's mostly about highlighting the evidence and showing people that 
while most of what we've been doing has been working, it's also not necessarily based on theories that can be replicated in every different location or that we can easily adapt to different situations and predict the effects that we'll be having. Uh, so as Katie was just mentioning, and the link is a bit too long to include anywhere it's here, but we recently did a really long review of basically all the different behavior change strategies and different tests that have been deployed in the field. Um, so what is basically an RCT, a randomized control trial, what was not, what are reliable results that we can deploy elsewhere. And so we did a big collection of all that. Um, and so with that, we're basically able to inform funders of this is what you could expect in this context. This is what you could expect in the other context. Um, another thing I do want to highlight though, is that obviously behavior change is about people and people are different. So it's important to know that yes, there's an evidence base. It's also important to know where there is no evidence. And I think that's a responsibility for us as a field also to generate that evidence, to test it and be honest when things work and when they don't work. Um, so that's something that we're not necessarily as good at, um, but as we're mostly natural scientists, we've all done experiments in the past, we know how biology works. Um, so that's something that also we need to start doing a lot more with behavior change. I would also note that um, but in the question, I think was specifically, I'm not sure exactly which thing the, the um, funder was asking about in terms of funding behavioral change or funding the threat of sewage pollution, but either way, the intersection is an interesting place to talk about it. Funders are people too. And so you can also apply this behavioral um, science to how you engage with those funders and think about the same things like that Katie just brought up around peers and how funders look at what their peers are doing. And so they are, so we can use that to, um, to uh, fund, to get, to seek, to get funding for the kinds of work that we think is important in this space. Um, we can also just amplify the importance of behavior change in this particular threat area and talk about that. But we can also just, you know, this because this particular threat, we're intersecting this with a threat of um, sewage pollution, because the things they're already investing in are things they care about, and this particular threat most likely undermines those outcomes, that's another way to think about behavior change, what is motivating them, what they care about. So we can play around a lot specifically with this particular intersection of threat and strategy, but I think, I don't know how Rare does this, but I would imagine you guys do think about how these, um, how this science applies to funders and how you engage with them and talk about this work. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of it, um, I think you heard in some of my answer around like, you, you know, they want to hear that they, like, there's, there's safety in the investment. There are these different kinds of strategies um, you mentioned the social influence. And so when you look at these um, sort of levers, a lot of it does come from um, some of these, uh, both the rational side of things, both understanding um, the impact and like the science and the calculating return on investment for the money, but also like kind of where the field is going and the social influence and this emotional, um, however they react, some like to be leaders, some like to feel a little safer and be in the forefront. So like all of these things come into play um, and it is kind of a spectrum of their decision making that you have to play to. Thanks everyone. This, this question feels related in terms of kind of how you demonstrate success. Um, so this, my question relates to the 8% change highlighted in the Kansas paper. Could that be considered a success by itself or should you take the smaller wins and aggregate them on the whole? That is a good question. I might kick it over to Phil to talk about the um, measurement, but I, I think uh, what I would say when I look at those results is I probably I would say it probably all depends. Um, it kind of depends on what kind of comparison samples are. I know um, some behavior change campaigns, you sometimes single digits is actually not a bad result, um, but Phil can probably, or sorry, Philip can probably talk more. Perfect. Yeah, so and that's a question that we get a lot. Um, and like Katie's saying, it kind of depends on the metric that you're using to compare. Um, in terms of cost, uh, this 8% success is incredible. It's a few cents for, I don't know exactly how many different uh, water treatment plants they, they looked at, but it probably costs somewhere around 10 to $20 for like a given area. And it reduced by 8% the sewage. So like this is an incredible result because having police police these areas, having new laws, giving people incentives or benefits would cost a lot more. So, so in that sense, it is a success. 
In another sense, though, and that's a problem that we do see a lot with simple nudges, um, so little like one-off interventions, are that they have an effect that's usually in the single digits. Um, so on average, I think there was a recent review that came out, and I think it was something like 1.4% when you rely only on messaging. So it's not a lot. Um, if you're comparing on terms of cost, it's great. But what you need to be thinking about, especially for the issues that we're facing, is okay, what are the different levers that I can use in conjunction? So sure, 1.4% for a single lever won't be much, but what if you pair that with something else? What if you pair that with something else? And so that's one thing we do at Rare. We have our own in-house programs, and within those programs, we combine different approaches. And so we reach effectiveness around 20, 30% for a lot of different behaviors that otherwise would not change. Uh, so in that sense, that's also another success. So Again, it's always going to be how you measure it and what would be the alternative. But if it's going to cost you a few cents to reach 8% um, as opposed to a few thousand dollars, um, that's going to be a great success for those implementers. If what you want to reach is 100%, you need to probably think about investing a bit more and using a combination of different levers. Um, also, one thing that's really important to note is that social levers are usually going to be some of the most effective ones. Um, so try to rely on those norms as much as possible because those also become self-enforcing and self-policing. So they might seem to cost a bit more at the beginning, but ultimately end up having really long-lasting results. Thanks, Philippe. You got a response to that from that question author. Thank you. Great answer. Um, and I should also note that um, when we send out the recording after the webinar, we can include some links to the different um, research papers that Philippe is referring to. Um, so we will, we will get you um, as many resources as we can after the webinar. Okay. Have you ever seen an initiative to change behavior backfire because the approach lacked cultural sensitivity? Please share any insights. Thank you. I can probably like jump into that one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think there's actually two things that are really important to note here that cultural insensitivity is definitely going to backfire. But even on a more basic level, um, some of these behavioral insights will backfire in just more general situations. Um, and there's really good ones. I'm going to keep talking about social norms just because I, I really promoted those. Um, make sure if you're promoting a norm that it's a positive norm and something that you want to be promoting so there's been many many examples for example where people go into it and they're going to be saying three out of four people do this don't be like those people but obviously you're promoting that norm right so you're saying well everyone else does it so the person reading that norm would think oh well if everyone else does it i'll do it too and it's something we've seen a lot during the covid <laughs> pandemic for example with mask wearing and a lot of different things where we actually promote the wrong norm, um, and so that's going to change. And then there's other things that will backfire if we're going more into the culturally uh, insensitive interventions, um, where people just don't take the time to, if you think about the BCD journey that Katie was talking about, where you have to really sit down and, and map out, okay, what is the behavior you want, and then empathize with your target audience, so really understand what is going to be a positive thing for them, what is going to be a negative thing for them. Um, and so often we're going to be, so I work a lot with um, agriculture, and so we're always going to be reinforcing, like, if you do this, you're going to have better profits, right? And that's not necessarily the thing you want to be doing everywhere. Um, so we work in Colombia, and actually in some of the communities, it wasn't about profit, it was about saving for your children. And it seems like a tiny difference, but we really needed to be mindful about that language. So it was about savings, it, was a, it wasn't about profit, it was about savings. And so these are things that you really need to be in tune with, you need to understand when you deploy an intervention. Um, so it takes time to refine and understand, but it's really worth it. Um, and so obviously different cultures will react to different things, and so you have to be mindful of this. And again, yeah, Kristen, you, you mentioned that you'll send some um, of the literature we have. Um, so in the review that we'll probably pass around after, you have a bunch of different examples of interventions working in some scenarios and not working in others. And again, I want to reinforce that a lot of this evidence is coming out of weird countries, so Western industrialized um, yeah, countries that are working in a developed setting. And there's not a lot of evidence coming out of the developing world. Um, and so again, that's something that we need to really start building on and sharing the evidence that we have of things that work and don't work. Because right now, the, the best evidence we have comes out of what works in the US, what works in Australia, what works in Canada. And we don't necessarily know 100% what works elsewhere. So, so that's something we need to be mindful of. 
Yeah, Phil, when you were talking, I was thinking about even the example um, from the petrified forests where they said like two thirds of people take wood, don't do that. And everybody else took wood. Um, so it happens in the environmental sector um, a lot. There's also some research um, from a woman from the University of Pennsylvania, um, Christ Christiana Bicchieri. And she did research on um, the role of social norms and how that interacts with um, rules and regulation and laws that were passed and found that um, if laws stray too far from a social norm, that they won't be that effective in actually getting people to adopt them and follow them. And so um, regardless of what lever you're using, if it is just one of this rational, more like law enforcement kinds of scenarios, you actually can run into um, not necessarily backfiring, but also just not being effective um, without understanding all of the kind of levers at play and really empathizing with your audience. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, and, and just to kind of add to that, for that question, I mean, that's really the beauty of this process or recipe that Katie has presented and the strategic communication planning process that we share through the network as well, is it helps you, you know, take the time to think through what your strategy should be, thinking about your audience and what they care about, and really um, that's where you'd spend a lot of time thinking about the culture, working with people from that culture to develop messaging, to develop what those actions should be. Um, and so that process kind of creates a, a lot of opportunities to try and avoid that um, kind of backfiring due to cultural um, inappropriateness. So that's great. And from a kind of personal experience with social marketing campaigns, the biggest kind of challenge that I've run into or backfire is, um, a messenger, a campaign messenger, uh, a challenge with that messenger going a bit rogue. Um, and so I'd say there are lots of ways that kind of whoopsies or you know challenges can pop up along your journey, but there are tools and resources to kind of help you course correct um, when little mistakes and snafus happen, which they will for, for any field and any project. Okay. Are there any examples of successful projects dealing with sewage management on small tropical islands in developing countries? So yes, I think um, like soil is potentially one of them. Um, so that was exciting. We have um, what I would point folks to as we, one of the things that we did with uh, in partnership with the Nature Conservancy and Inter-American Development Bank and Lonely Whale and Ocean Conservancy and um, 11th Hour Racing is we launched this contest called um, Solution Search Water Pollution and Behavior Change. Um, it focused more broader than just um, sewage pollution to all sources of pollution, but it looked at um, how organizations are applying um, behavioral insights to tackle and reduce water pollution worldwide. Um, that contest, we're in a voting phase right now, so I like recommend checking it out and voting. Um, but also we solicit, we found a hundred different solutions from 33 countries around the world, um, all applying behavioral insights to the work they do. And we have that database open and available so that folks can actually go in and click through and, and search and like see exactly kind of examples of people who are implementing great work and contact them. I think um, also from my understanding and you, you the TNC folks could speak more to it, but I think even Reef Resilience Network is looking at building out more case studies too um, that can be relevant to various fields. Yeah, and we also, we did a webinar, was it in March, Kristen, where we profiled three different um, projects. One of them was not tropical um, island. We had Tanzania, Honduras, and what was Puerto the Rico. third? Rico. Okay, so there, and those were examples of addressing this issue, and some of them, I think the Honduras one had the most behavior change sort of strategies in it. But um, we are working on building out those case studies and sharing those experiences through the Reef Resilience Network. Yep, and those case studies will be released um, next month, early next month, when we release the new toolkit, and so we'll have case studies, and we'll have uh, summaries of journal articles to publish papers in addition to kind of web pages breaking down information and sharing additional resources and i should add that in our case study database 
currently um, we have a couple case studies highlighting rare campaigns um, around the world. So if you don't want to wait uh, for the for the release, you can go ahead and explore now and check out those rare uh, cases, not addressing sewage issues, but other conservation challenges. And so lessons can be applied. Okay, it looks like we have time for one more question. Um, this feels like a big one, but in Hawaii, our sewage prevention strategies are very expensive, and the local government agency was recently sued and lost. So our audience is both the public and the government, and there's a need for a big cash infusion. What thoughts do you have on this? This does sound like a big one. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. Um, well, first, I would actually start with the framing piece of it. So I would actually identify what are your target audiences and like what do you actually want them to do like literally the behavior that you want them to do and it sounds to me like probably the public and consumers is a sec completely separate audience from the government and so you would have kind of different design processes going and so my recommendation would be to like start in the framing step we have worksheets on behavior.rare.org where you can actually help you start framing the problem, identifying the actors, and then start working through your steps um, to very strategically and logically move through how you will develop an intervention that will reach your end goal. That feels like a very short answer to a very big problem, but I, I feel like we might not have time to really dig in, but I'm happy like to kind of follow up and point to specific tools or resources that might be useful. Leap step. Either one of you want to chime in? We may have time for one more question. Yeah, my answer would be along the same lines as Katie. Um, don't know enough about the situation, so it's really important to go through the entire design process, understand exactly what the behavior is. And I think that's really important to, to also note that that's a common mistake we do, where we just assume, like, oh, we'll reduce greenhouse gas, or oh, we'll yeah treat water before it goes out. Like, what is the exact behavior you want people to do? And then make sure all your interventions target that exact behavior or that it targets intermediate steps to get to that behavior. Um, so, so really bring everything in focus to a single thing, because often we're going to use one campaign to do multiple different things. And that that's not necessarily the best way to do it. You want to have a specific lever for each behavior that you want or multiple lever for one behavior. And I would add um, that if you can avoid reinventing the wheel, to do that um, and that there are while this isn't a heavily practiced um, area at this point in time around the world there are some great examples that you can draw a lot of learning from um, we started out this series with um, a two-part from uh, long island and they face very similar challenges um, to hawaii with needing to upgrade um, from cesspools to septic or improving their septic systems. I know Hawaii has to do a huge tran transition to um, something other than cesspools. Um, and so if you haven't watched those, I'm not sure who asked the question, but um, I would encourage you to watch those because there's a lot of inspiration and um, surprisingly a lot of similarities between Long Island and Hawaii in this, in this problem space. Thanks. Okay, I'm just going to sneak one question, or one more, maybe we could be short, brief answer, but what should we do to encourage our social media friends to reduce sewage or address the climate emergency? So, so social media friends, like people on Twitter and Facebook and that kind of thing? Yeah. Well, okay. Um, so I think it would, helping them understand exactly what you're trying to ask people to do so that you are clarifying with them what is the message and the framing for how um, to communicate to people so that they are in line with like actually saying the same thing that you want them to say. I think there's a real opportunity when we at um, uh, the center were talking a little bit about climate change and like one of the real opportunities that exist in this space is that our research was showing that people don't necessarily think that other people are thinking about climate. And so um, the gap and the solution was really in helping people understand that others are thinking about it. No one's talking about it because they think no one else wants to talk about it. And so um, there's a real opportunity, I think, with social media to 
elevate those conversations when you identify that there's a potential gap and like that is the problem. Um, so you, you mentioned climate as one of the things like that is one of the problems we've identified. So it allows for those conversations to happen. I think in the sewage space too, um, one of the problems is like it's not cool to talk about. Um, it's embarrassing. And so there are ways to kind of um, start opening the door to those conversations. But I would really also communicate to your social media staff not to just create messages without making sure they're aligned with whatever you're trying to say. I would just put a little plug in for um, the Ocean Sewage Alliance, of which the Nature Conservancy and RARE are both partners. Um, it's launching uh, June 8th on World Oceans Day, and we are going to have a campaign to raise awareness around this. Um, and you'll be able to go maybe sooner than June 8th, but to OceanSewageAlliance.org. And we do have a very short list, so Katie will like this, of things you can do. We give suggestions for home, community, and supporting out, you know, beyond that. So you, what you can do at home and, and whatnot. So we're trying to keep it sweet and simple, but we are gonna experiment with a social campaign um, with our social media friends, and we'll see how that goes and share that with you. But we encourage you to engage with us on that. Thanks, Steph, and thank you to, to all of our panelists, Katie, Thank you so much for that presentation. We are at time, so want to wrap the discussion. We encourage you to continue the discussion on Reef Resilience Network Forum, which is our online community of reef managers and practitioners. There is a link there that you can um, access the forum. We'll also be sending out that information as well as the links to our communication resources, like I said, in our announcement after the webinar. Our next webinar is July 13th. This will be on active coral restoration techniques for a changing planet. So Dr. Dave Vaughn and several of his co-authors will share about their newly published book of the same title. Um, so please join us. Stay tuned to find out about the next sewage series webinar. Um, and please, at the close of the webinar, take a, a really short survey, I think it's three questions, and give us some feedback on this webinar and other topics you'd like to learn about. Um, thanks to all of our presenters. Thanks to everyone for joining. See you soon.